logistic regression stuff up today. I'm uh, going to take a look at, uh, uh, well, going to review a little bit, and then we're going to look at uh, model and case-wise uh, diagnostics. Uh, I really don't know what I want to do first, you know, to be honest with you. Um, let's, uh, I'll tell you what, let's, let's go ahead and prepare R to get it ready uh, to, to, to do what, uh, what, we're, what I want to do today. So, um, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, set our working directory. And let's go get our data. And I believe I called that tutor. Don't remember. Uh, let's attach the data. And let's look at uh, the name. So cause you, it, this is what we uh, dealt with uh, in the previous video, success and tutor in my math lab. Just to give you updates, success is defined as success in the course C or higher. Um, tutor is, uh, yes, they either went to the so many Friday sessions or they didn't. In my math lab, I think that's the number of days they spent an hour or longer in the learning modules. Now, gang, the first thing we'd have to do here is we'd need to set up our uh, our baseline. So what I'd want to do here is I'd want to set up a data for success in the um, command in R is to uh, relevel. So I want to go uh, data uh, success. And I want to set no as my baseline. Now, next thing I want to do is for my other ca categorical variable, uh, I want to set uh, tutor and relevel data success tutor. And of course, I think that was actually is none. Now, gang, this is a good time to, to talk about this. If we had a categorical predictor uh, such as tutor that was uh, had more than two categories. Here we have none and I think yes or whatever it may be. Uh, we would have to set up dummy variables just as we did back in Math 5500. The beauty of uh, uh, dummy variables for logistic regression using the GLM uh, command is it will set it up automatically so we don't have to go in and set up the uh, uh, the dummy variables as we do with multiple regression. All right, gang, what I want to do is just, uh, I want to, uh, a little bit of this is going to be repetitive, but I want this stuff in R so I can work with it. So uh, first thing I'd want to do is run my general linear, linear model uh, where success is uh, uh, predicted from tutor. And of course, I want to run binomial. And when I do summary model one, uh, we can see that uh, we get a statistically significant predictor in terms of tutor. So again, this tutor yes says that it's comparing tutor yes to the other, which is no, because it said no is the baseline, uh, or none, however we set that. Actually, it was none, yeah. So, um, and we have a statistically significant uh, 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 p value uh, predictor for for uh, for tutor. Yeah, uh, I want to also run uh, model two. I'm just going to go back up here and get it. And uh, but I want to come in here and I want to run tutor plus my math lab. And let me go over here and change this to model two. So I'm going to put in uh, the other. Uh, predictor model two, which uh, is, is not categorical quantitative predictor. And you can see that uh, the residual deviance is 144.16. When I throw the other predictor in there, the de residual deviance doesn't change. And in fact, AIC actually increases. And remember, AIC is just a measure of uh, the, uh, the adequacy of our model. And the higher this value is, uh, you can think of it as being uh, uh, creating a, uh, uh, you know, a worse predictor. Now, I showed you in the previous video how we could go through and create the, um, uh, the model change and look at the difference in model one deviance minus model two deviance, look at the difference in degrees of freedom, and calculate a probability, uh, a p-value, using p chi square. Uh, I'm going to show you an alternative to that. We could actually do ANOVA one uh, 
uh, over Model 2 uh, ANOVA, I'm sorry, uh, Model 1, uh, comma Model 2. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us the same information we would do if we set up the, um, uh, the change in deviances and the change in the degrees of freedom for the residual uh, component. Uh, what we would do here is we would look at uh, the, the model degrees of freedom, which are 1, and we would look at the change in the deviance, which is this value right here. So then we could calculate uh, our p-value uh, by taking uh, 1 minus p chi square of our value, which is 0 0.009835, comma, our degrees of freedom um, to get our p-value 0.9644 or 0.9645. Now remember, guys, the uh, the null hypothesis says that the uh, adding the predictor doesn't uh, improve the model, and the alternative hypothesis would be adding the predictor does improve the model. So we would fail to reject the null, which uh, uh, says that adding my math lab uh, does uh, does really uh, nothing in terms of uh, in, in improving our model. Now. Um, Hard to say where I want to go from here. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's. Um, this is going to be a pretty long video, I do believe. Uh, it's, it's always kind of hard to know for sure. Uh, but um, let's uh, let's get into uh, case-wise diagnostics. And this is a part that I really enjoy teaching in 6500. I don't uh, think I'm going to be teaching 6500 uh, anytime soon, but when I did teach it, I really enjoyed uh, the, the case-wise diagnostics component. Uh, what I want you to know about uh, in case-wise uh, di <laughs> diagnostics, easy for you to say, uh, just uh, as with uh, simple linear regression, uh, we can calculate See if I could write uh, something, get a piece of cereal or something that's um, making my paper stand up. Uh, so just as we, uh, with simple linear regression, we can calculate uh, residuals uh, to examine how our model uh, fits the data. getting ready to get loud. Girls and Tanya are out playing in the snow, so they just came in. The other thing I want you to think uh, also with the simple linear regression, uh, we can use the RESID command for whatever we've named our model uh, to easily, uh, this thing is driving me insane again, uh, to easily uh, uh, to calculate the residuals. Uh, we're also going to want to look at our fitted values. Now, typically, uh, those are our y hats, but uh, for logistic regression, I hope you know that uh, our fitted values are uh, uh, the, uh, the probabilities of y. So, uh, more specifically, uh, our fitted values uh, provide uh, the predicted prob probabilities. each case or subject uh, so let's see more specifically our fitted values um, provide the predicted probabilities for each uh, case or subjects uh, from the predicted probabilities
we can uh, predict group membership. And uh, since our focus is on, uh, on group one, which is success, uh, what we may do and what we would probably do If we have a probability between 0 and 0.5, uh, then we would for predict this person to be in group 0, which would be the uh, lack of success or failure. But if we have something from 0.5, I uh, forget that's there. Uh, no, 0.5, uh, the probability of a Y sub I, uh, then we would predict um, group uh, 1 membership. And uh, guys, I'll show you uh, how to do this and add it to a data frame so we can, uh, so we can organize uh, our information, okay? Now, uh, guys, long story short, I would never, ever, ever consider running uh, a simple linear regression without checking uh, how well the, the, the model fits our data. So, uh, you know, that's an integral part of... Uh, of uh, uh, you know our uh, model diagnostics, keeping it you know super duper duper simple. Uh, if we have, for example, our x, which is our predicted value, and we're going to examine the, our residuals over that particular x, well, if we get a residual uh, scatter plot that looks like this, then this tells us that the relationship between y and our x is not linear. So if we try to fit a linear model to that, then, um, then we, we, we're, just, um, we're, we're, we're using the wrong, uh, the wrong tool for the job. So uh, case-wise diagnostics um, you know, give us a way um, for examining how well the, um, hmm, I don't know why that's doing that. I thought I had it fixed. All right, gang. Let's, uh, Let's uh, let's get out of here and go back to uh, uh, now to, to R. And something I want to tell you, even though we find out here that um, that our first model is the best, I want to do the calculations for the second model. So I'm kind of uh, you know doing this inappropriately because we know that the second model, uh, uh, the first model is uh, you know adding my math lab doesn't do anything to to improve the model. But nevertheless, I want to do this for illustration because the other kind of gets too simple of uh, calculations. Now, guys, if I calculate on the estimates, uh, I can see that my uh, B0 is negative 0.2347. And I'm going to call it my B1 here is 1.2335. And I'm writing all this stuff down. And the my math lab, which I'll call it B2, is negative point uh, zero zero seven eight four. All right. So guys, uh, what I want to do is go back to um, go back to this, and you can see what I did is uh, I wrote these things down. Now, my first case. had a uh, tutor in a my math lab and yeah, let's go get that now I'm going to actually have to look at my uh, look at my data here so I'm just going to have to type uh, data all right so my first subject here um, has a tutor of none so that's going to be uh, zero and a my math lab of eight. Now, what I want to do is I want to predict the uh, get the get the fitted value. Well, where am I going here, guys? Uh, I want to get the fitted value uh, for this first subject. So, guys, recall that the um, fitted value for the first subject would be the probability uh, of y sub one, and our model is one over one plus e to the minus and it's going to be uh, uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 
plus beta 2 x2 in general. So gang, for this particular subject, we will have 1 over 1 plus e to the minus. Our beta 0 is negative 0.2347 plus uh, beta 1, which is 1.2335. My x1 value is 0. And I have minus 0 0.00784 times the x2 value, uh, which is equal to 8. Now, uh, if I could put that in my calculator, I should have already had this done. Actually, I do already have it done. Uh, it turns out it's uh, 0.426. So the way to, uh, to, the way to interpret this 0.426 tells us that approximately 43% uh, uh, of the people who have uh, uh, this condition, if you will, didn't go to the tutor on Fridays and spent eight days of one hour or more on my math lab would have a 0.426 probability of success. I didn't say that correctly. Let me tell you about percentage and let me tell you about probability. I combined them and that was a complete mess. 42.6% of the people who didn't go to tutor and had eight hours of my math lab uh, would succeed in this course. Or we can say that the probability is 0.426 uh, of course, success for the person who didn't go to tutoring and who had my math lab um, eight hours. Now, guys, again, this is using both predictors, and uh, if I were doing this in, in real time, uh, I would eliminate that part right there because we see that my math lab didn't do anything uh, to uh, uh, improve the model. Now, there are ways that uh, we can do this kind of stuff uh, Using, using R much quicker than going through all, what, 117 cases and making these calculations uh, by hand. So uh, backing up just a little bit, uh, uh, assuming that uh, we all buy into um, uh, tutor sessions and my math lab having a substantive or a significant, uh, uh, or significant in predicting uh, course success, keep in mind my, my math lab isn't, so I'm uh, st uh, stretching things here a little bit, but I wanted to illustrate this with a two two predictor model. Uh, we um, we would want to uh, you know perform uh, case wise diagnostics. Now, uh, what I what I want to do, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know what I want to do. I'll tell you what. Let's get out of this and let's get into our and go ahead and create some case-wise diagnostics, and then I'll tell you what these things stand for and what they mean and what, they, uh, what the, the thresholds for making certain decisions uh, will be. Uh, the first thing I'd want to do, so I'm going to do hashtag, uh, and so what I'm doing here is performing case-wise diagnostics. The first thing I'd want to do is get my fitted values. So I'm just going to call that the predicted probabilities. That's what we just calculated for the first subject. And uh, guys, I'm going to run all this for model two. Again, I know that I'm violating uh, kind of the rules of the game here. If I were really interested in this and I were going to publish this, I would say that I ran model one, I ran model two. There wasn't a statistically significant difference between model two and model one. Therefore, I'm not going to include my math lab. But for illustrations, I'm going to uh, bend the rules of the game just a little bit. Well, actually, I'm bending the rules of the game quite a bit. So I'm uh, doing the predicted probabilities. And uh, uh, the next thing I want to do is get my residuals. And I'm just going to uh, name these residuals. Now, guys, if I just wanted to see the residuals, I would just type R-E-S-I-D, Model 2, and I would get those. But I want to save these as residuals because I want to create a new data frame that allows me to look at important uh, uh, levels of, uh, of model and case-wise diagnostics. Uh, something else that I think would be uh, interesting to run are standardized residuals. Standardized residuals put us in the realm of z-scores, so they just take every single uh, residual, uh, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and uh, standardize it. Turns out that um, R, if I could spell, 
uh, does this uh, very quickly with just R standard. Now gang, three things that I don't think we've encountered. Uh, these are called DF betas, uh, DF fits, and leverage statistics. Uh, are found this way, and I'm going to explain to you what these are because this is probably going to be new uh, terminology. Uh, DF betas allow us to examine uh, the impact of our coefficients with each individual subject taken out. So in other words, what if we had one subject who has just this incredible power on our results, not statistical power, but has this uh, overwhelming uh, impact on our final results. Well, we would want to examine, we, first of all, we'd want to identify that person and we'd want to evaluate our model both with and without the person involved. Now, chances are if we run into a subject like that with that much statistical influence in our model, chances are it's not a natural phenomena. Chances are it's an error. Uh, chances are it's an error that somebody did in coding data, entering data. You know, the person was supposed to be 118 pounds and whoever typed the data in accidentally put a zero and had a 1180 pound person. So uh, chances are these things are uh, typos, but they don't always have to be. So DF beta uh, is one way that we can do this. And uh, it's uh, our command is just DF beta. Uh, another thing that I'm going to uh, teach you a little bit about are called DF fits. And uh, Now, why did I do that? Because um, I, don't, I don't like that. Uh, I want DF betas. Uh, this is supposed to be a model 2. So that should rewrite uh, DF betas. Yeah. And uh, DF fit. Um, okay, should be DF fits and not DF fit. And another thing we do is uh, leverage statistics. Uh, and this actually comes from our hat matrix. So if, I don't know if you remember much about that from many moons ago. Uh, the hat matrix is just that, that matrix um, uh, X transpose, inverse of X transpose X times X that uh, turns uh, uh, observed Y values into predicted values. So, uh, so guys, we find our leverage uh, statistics um, like that. Now, what uh, I'd like to do is I'd like to create a couple of new data frames. And uh, so the first data frame I'd like to do, I'm going to call this uh, uh, new data one. And I'm going to create a new data frame. And I want my success. I want my tutor. I want my math, my math lab score. And I want my predicted probabilities and my residuals. Because I'd like to go through and explain to you what these things look like. Now, um, if you look at uh, subject number one, it should be no surprise to you that the predicted probability is 4.26. Uh, because that's exactly what we, um, uh, what we calculated. Uh, at, le at least I believe it was. Better have been. Uh, what we calculated by hand. Uh, yeah, uh, the residual is just the uh, difference in the observed y and the predicted y. So the uh, residual here would be uh, 1.3. And when you come down here, you see some of these uh, residuals are actually uh, negative. Okay, so what we could do is we could actually um, uh, set up uh, using the predicted probabilities. So this subject number one, we're predicting this person uh, to, uh, to not succeed, whereas we are predicting, for example, subject number 74, uh, we are predicting this person to succeed. Now you might say, well, that's kind of strange that the division between success and not success is completely dependent up on none and yes. Well, if you're paying attention, that shouldn't be any surprise at all because uh, we, uh, we, we said that. Uh, this My Math Lab has very little predictive uh, potential capability in our model where it's all pretty much depends on tutor. So if you didn't go to tutor, we're predicting you not to succeed. 
Whereas if you did go to the tutor sessions, uh, there's about a 0.72 probability that you are going to succeed. Now, um, these, um, so anyway, uh, we, could, we could clearly set up, uh, write a, a little entry to, to have anything above 0.5 as a group membership one and the other uh, group, group membership number two. All right, so uh, guys, let's get out of this, and I'm going to do a little bit of teaching. There's going to be some new stuff, and um, so, all right, so new stuff. Uh, let's go through all these DF betas and uh, DF fits and stuff, and uh, see if we can see if we can learn some stuff. All right, so uh, first of all. Uh, DF betas, just uh, implied in the name, uh, it should tell you that that has something to do with the difference in the betas. And it's exactly what it does. Uh, DF uh, betas uh, examine uh, the influence of the ith case. on each of the estimated uh, coefficients when the ith case is <laughs> when the ith case is deleted. So in other words it looks at the overall model and then it, uh, for each of the estimated uh, coefficients, and then it takes each case out and looks at the difference in the change of the estimated coefficients. Common sense should kick in a little bit and tell you if there's a, uh, a drastic change, uh, then, uh, then that uh, case is having a significant influence on the estimated uh, coefficients. Uh, I think it really helps, uh, I don't know if I can get this right or not, but um, the the DF beta calculation, let's say for the kth predictor, uh, is just found by taking the beta for the kth predictor, rerunning the model, and looking at the beta for the kth predictor with the ith subject deleted, and that's the way we do that over the square root of the mean square error term with the ith case deleted uh, times ckk. Now guys, ckk is just the uh, kth diagonal element of uh, x transpose x inverse. Now guys, I'm giving you this in general, just in terms of general regression. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. Um, but it gives you, a, gives you an indication for logistic regression. We look, nevertheless, we look at the betas and uh, uh, then we have to, to, to divide by uh, kind of an error component. Um, in simple linear regression, uh, the DF fits give us. Uh, these things examine the influence uh, that the ith case has on the fitted values. Now, our fit of values here are the probability of y's, right? So, uh, uh, in general, uh, for the simple linear regression model, we should say, or multiple linear, linear regression model, uh, DF fits uh, for the ith case uh, are found by looking at the predicted value 
including uh, the well for the uh, for the uh, for the ith case minus the predicted value for the ith case when the ith case is deleted uh, divided by the mean square error where the ith case is deleted times hii. Now guys, uh, hii is the diagonal element for the hat matrix. And if you remember, uh, the hat matrix is that matrix that uh, turns our observed Ys into predicted Ys. Now, uh, another thing we, uh, we look at here, we uh, create what are called leverage statistics. Or leverage values. And... Uh, these are uh, just, uh, again, another influence statistic. And uh, guys, these are nothing more than the diagonal elements of the hat matrix. And uh, I, I go through... Um, uh, a proof of that in 6500, but uh, again, this is for simple linear regression. But this stuff uh, extends nicely over into, into logistic regression. And really, again, this is an applied class, so uh, uh, the, the thing I want you to know are the thresholds of when leverage statistics and DF betas and DF fits and uh, VIF, these variance inflation factors we'll talk about a little later. You know, when does that uh, tell us that we have uh, potential issues with our logistic regression model? Now, Guys, from there on, we have uh, quite a few rules of thumb. Uh, in fact, uh, before I did this lecture, I looked up uh, <laughs> I looked up three uh, uh, three different uh, textbooks, and I got something. Uh, something different uh, in each case. Uh, who I'm going to go with here, I'm going to go with the field. And uh, what he says is for logistic regression for the leverage, uh, one way of thinking about it is these uh, leverage statistics are going to run from 0 to 1. And 0 says no influence and one uh, complete influence. All right. Uh, typically, I would say that uh, if we have an influence value that is greater than 0.5, Uh, that is a high leverage statistic, a high leverage value, so that would uh, require uh, examination. I think if the influence is between 0.2 and 0.5, then we have a moderate influence. And guys, anything... Uh, strictly below 0.2, low influence. In terms of examination, uh, clearly uh, leverage statistics above 0.5, then uh, we need to, to pay close attention uh, to that particular case. All right, gang, uh, standardized residuals. Uh, you should know that in standardized residuals that uh, there's something really holy about 95% in the statistics community. And you should know that plus or minus 1.96 and 95% are uh, forever merged, forever married. Uh, 
Nine six, I think of two. So guys, any uh, standardized residual above two or below negative two, uh, I would uh, take a look at it. Uh, but for me, uh, plus or minus three is the threshold for standardized residuals uh, indicating that I need to do something. Guys, DF betas and uh, DF fits um, are, uh, are the easiest ones. Uh, anytime you uh, have something above one, so if a DF fit or, um, or a DF beta is uh, greater than one, then that would tell me that um, we need to take a look at stuff. Now, um, let's, uh, let's create a new data frame. Let's go uh, over here 